Hi everyone, and welcome to this video where we look at another member of my classic computer collection. And today's video is on the IBM PC. Now this video, like many of the others I've put up recently, is a remake of a low definition version. So if you've seen this video before, you might not see much that's new, but you will see it in uh, higher quality and the audio might be better too. So the IBM PC is a real classic computer. And just before uh, we have a look at the hardware, I want to put it in context for the time that it was introduced. For those of you that might not have been there at the time or perhaps don't know too much about the history of microcomputers, let me just spend a few minutes talking about its introduction. So we'll go back to the year 1980 and look at what microcomputing was doing at that time. So in that year, it was starting to get away from its hobbyist roots and you were getting machines coming out that were being targeted at one of two markets. The first market was a high-end market where the machines were quite expensive. Uh, they tended to have a lot of screen real estate so you could fit a lot on the screen uh, they often came packaged with their own screens. They tended to have fast storage uh, and quite a bit of it. Usually this meant a couple of disk drives. Color and sound weren't important and graphics weren't that important either. So most of them were monochrome. And many of them ran an operating system called CPM. Not all of them, but uh, most of them did. So you had a sort of business uh, segment of the market there. Then you had another market for microcomputers, and that was the home market. Again, this was a growing one, and in this market you had machines that were very cheap. Uh, they had color, they had sound, uh, they were machines you could play games on, and perhaps learn a bit of programming, and uh, they were used for other educational tasks. Essentially, they slotted into that same segment of the market that video game consoles did. And models that typify a home computer of the time would be would be ones like the TRS-80 Color Computer, uh, Commodore VIC-20. Now, in the middle between these two markets, you also have one or two models. And what I could think of is, say, the Apple II Plus. That sort of fitted in the middle because you could plug it into a television, so it could be a home computer, uh, it had colour, graphics, you could play good games on it, but it was also capable enough to be used in business. It normally came with a floppy drive or two, and if you added a Z80 counter to it, uh, then you could run CPM as well. So that was the state of the microcomputer industry or markets, if you like, um, in about 1980. Now, IBM, of course, had been into computers for decades. And their main business was at that very high corporate end uh, where they looked after large business, uh, banks, uh, people with um, high requirements for data processing and computing. But they were watching this, they were watching these microcomputers very carefully and they could see that at some stage, given the development of these small microcomputers, that they, there might be a market opportunity here. And that if they just ignore it, perhaps you know, some of these computers will be capable enough to start to threaten their main business. So they felt that it was probably time for them to enter uh, this microcomputing market. So what they did is they got a team together at IBM and put them on to the task of designing their first microcomputer. Now they did this in a, in a rather special way. Traditionally, if you wanted to do something at IBM, it took a long time. It was a very bureaucratic organization. You had a number of committees you had to, um, you had to go through, uh, development plans had to be approved and then approved again. Um, a lot of red tape, things took ages to get done. So um, very wisely, this development team that was put together was excluded from all of that. They were sort of put really 
outside IBM's normal development pathways and just talk to get on with the job. And to get on with the job they did, so a year later they had built their microcomputer. And it wasn't anything very special. They used off-the-shelf parts because they wanted something done fairly quickly. Uh, and it was a fairly conservative design. If I was to compare it to uh, a computer that was around at the time, it was probably closest to, in design concept anyway, to the Apple II, in that you had a single uh, main board that contained processor and, and RAM and, and most of the logic chips, and you had a series of expansion slots where you could um, slip in other hardware to extend the system. It was a very flexible design, and it certainly worked well for Apple, and uh, obviously IBM felt it would work well for them. So this IBM PC came out in 1981, targeted at the business market. There was a lot of excitement by the press, and the excitement was because here was a big name in computing, taking the small computers seriously, in effect, bringing out one of their own. So a lot of hype, a lot of interest, and a lot of sales, particularly by business and high, the high end of business, so the, the large businesses, the corporate account managers. Here were machines that they could buy and not lose sleep over. They were buying them from a company that they knew well. It was another corporate just like them. Uh, these uh, machines had service contracts, so they could buy whole truckloads of them and know that if anything went wrong, the IBM name was behind them. So uh, these machines took off. Uh, so sales started in 1981. By 1983, uh, they were going well. And in fact, something else had happened that also boosted um, the IBM at least the IBM pack for, and that was that clones had arrived. Now, what some companies had done was to legally reverse engineer uh, the IBM PC and sell machines that were compatible with it. Now, this was something that really pushed along this platform and uh, made it a standard, and that the business market was crying out for standards. Before the IBM PC came along and the clones came along, there were real, really no standards. A CPM was a type of standard, but you couldn't take a disk, say that you'd written files to one CPM computer, go to a different make and model and expect um, the computer to be able to read that disk. So all those disk formats were different. So um, a standard was, was really something that the industry wanted. Now, with um, the IBM having been accepted in the market so well, of course, the IBM clones were also accepted well into the market. And very soon, by about 1983, if you were, if you were making a computer to sell into the business market, you just could not put anything in there that was going to be successful unless it was IBM PC compatible. So um, within just a few years... Uh, you ended up with um, uh, a standard for the business market. And um, IBM, uh, the IBM standard really didn't look back. Uh, and in fact, the desktops that we uh, have today can trace their lineage back to the IBM PC and the introduction of that standard. Now, the home market uh, remained, um, you know, a, a bazaar of different uh, types of makes and models all incompatible with one another but from about yeah from 1981 to 93 1983 onwards certainly the business side of the market settled down uh, to this IBM PC standard so let's take a look at it you would expect IBM's marketing to be pretty slick and indeed it was they themed their ads with a silent movie character of the 1920s Charlie Chaplin, and tended to use a minimalistic style as demonstrated in this image, with a simple white table and a rose. The result was both charm and appeal. Despite this wistful imagery though, when you got down to it, the IBM PC was primarily designed to be a corporate workhorse. Spreadsheets, 
databases and word processors would be the staple diet of anyone parked in front of one of these units. As mentioned in the introduction, the computer press was hugely excited by this machine, and in no time at all, a publishing industry developed to support it. Model-specific magazines had played a large part in the success of the likes of the Apple II and Tandy's TRS-80 machines in the past, and very soon, new magazines like this one were riding on the back of the IBM PC hype. In 1981, Apple Computer saw itself as potentially a bigger player in the business scene. The company certainly had press profile, although it hadn't really cracked the corporate market. Nevertheless, they placed this ad in the computer press welcoming IBM to the microcomputer market. The tone of the ad was that of a patronising supreme creator greeting some Johnny-come-lately uh, to its market space. Apple's claim in the ad that they invented the first personal computer was pure spin, of course, and there was no way Apple Computer, despite their recent successes, had the wealth, infrastructure, and corporate clout of Big Blue. In that sense, it was a very cheeky shot from Apple, and reflected their unconventional approach. However, it did bring a smile to the faces of industry observers at the time. In my introduction, I talked about the desire for standards at the higher end of the microcomputer market. These standards went further than just the architecture of the hardware, though. A standard software platform was also desired. The IBM PC provided that, but it was not IBM's doing. Now let me explain. The IBM machines commonly were bundled with an operating system called PC-DOS. IBM didn't write this operating system, though. It was owned by Microsoft, the company run by this man, Bill Gates. IBM purchased the rights to brand the Oz as their own and sell it with their PCs. During negotiations with IBM, Microsoft negotiated successfully to retain the rights to the operating system and sell it to other manufacturers. IBM, thinking there would be no other manufacturers who would use the operating system, was quite happy with this arrangement. Had they known what was around the corner, they probably would have insisted that Microsoft sell them the operating system outright. Once the legal PC clones appeared, Microsoft had just the operating system for those clones, MS-DOS, which was the same as, and so completely compatible with, PC-DOS. With both the IBM PC and the clone machines using Microsoft's operating system, and these machines putting pay to all competitors in the business market, the stage was set for Microsoft's dominance of the desktop, which persists even into 2014. Underscoring the dominance of Microsoft's software platform is this ad, placed by Microsoft in magazines around 1983-84. Like it or not, and for better or worse, what was stated in the ad was indeed the case. Microsoft was completely dominant, Digital Research, whose CPM operating system was almost a de facto Oz on the 8-bit business machines, was squeezed right out of the picture. Actually, IBM almost went with Digital Research for their favourite operating system, rather than Microsoft. I don't have time to tell the story of why they didn't go with Digital Research, but if you don't know, it's worth looking up. It's a prime example of a huge lost opportunity. OK, that's enough background. Let's do what you came here for and have a close look at the hardware. Here's my machine. It's in beautiful condition and I have some manuals and software to keep it company. This unit has colour graphics and a colour screen. In the early 1980s this was considered a frivolous luxury in business and most bog standard IBM PCs of the day were monochrome. So let's have a look at this beauty. I do like the design of these machines. They look solid, they feel solid, and they've got a steel case, and they look all the part uh, of a serious business computer. There's our keyboard. These are buckling spring keyboards, and they have a really nice feel to them. In fact, my existing machine, my uh, Windows XP machine, I have one of these types of keyboards attached to it. It's a later IBM uh, keyboard model. And I absolutely love it. Uh, they're quite noisy, uh, but they are a joy to use. 
So you can see it's a pretty conventional um, QWERTY design here. Function keys down the left though, not across the top. And notice how small the shift keys are. That was a bit problematic initially and in later keyboards uh, those shift keys were much bigger. Here are the two disk drives. Uh, in this particular machine uh, they're double sided 40 track so you've got 360 kilobytes on each disk. And there's our colour screen. If we come around the side here we'll see the, the big red switch that was characteristic of I, the IBM PC. You'll see me throwing that a little later in this video. Here we are around the back. This machine came to me from the USA and it has a USA power supply. So I've got a note there to remind myself to use my step down transformer. Otherwise it would be just too easy to plug one of these into straight into the power socket and uh, the result wouldn't be pretty. So there you can see a small socket for the keyboard and cassette. These uh, IBM PCs had a cassette port even though they, they weren't sold into the home. I guess it was cheap enough to, to put that socket in there. Later variations like the IBM XT didn't have a cassette port. And you can see three uh, connectors there from cards that are in the machine. One's a floppy disk extension. Uh, there's a asynchronous card, in other words a serial port, and the video card has a couple of sockets. Uh, the one down the bottom is for plugging into the standard colour monitor that I've got with the machine. And the other socket at the top is to interface the machine to a composite monitor. So that's the back of the unit. If we take off the case, this is what we can see inside. So you're looking at a corner of the motherboard here, the corner containing the RAM chips. You can see the banks of them there. It's a little speaker. You can see the three cards that are installed. And you can see the slots. There are five of them in total in these IBM PCs. We're looking straight down on the processor now, that long chip just behind the cassette socket. Uh, there's an empty one there that uh, is for the maths coprocessor, which uh, I don't have installed. And that's just a side view of the cards. And you can see how long that uh, color graphics card is. It goes the whole length of the machine. It's huge. And there are the two uh, disk drives. It's the circuit boards on the top of those. You can see there's not too much room behind them. Things are crammed up a bit because you've got this very large power supply. Here's a still photo of the motherboard. Uh, you can see it's quite a simple design, really, and not particularly big. Uh, once you get it out of the machine, uh, you know, I, I was surprised at how small it is. It doesn't take up the whole base of the machine. Uh, uh, and it's quite an elegant piece of work. I just thought I'd show you this. This is a monochrome graphics card. It also has a, a printer interface on it. I haven't got this installed in the machine, although I could well have it installed if I wanted to give myself a, a parallel printer port. Uh, the machine can accommodate both of those video cards, even though it can only use one at a time. But uh, you can have both in there, providing you set the dip switches just right. It's now time to get the machine up and running, and I'll show you some software. And what I'll do is I'll show you some of the software that IBM itself put out with the machine. Uh, many of the programs are, are in these manuals. Rather than to show you a whole lot of other software, because it was just heaps of software that was written for this particular machine. So I'll show you some classic IBM software. This is software uh, that new owners would have played with when they first got the machines. So we'll flick the big red switch to turn it on and we'll go through a boot sequence. Now the first thing that happens with these machines is absolutely nothing. It's actually doing a RAM check but there's no indication of that other than a flashing cursor at the top. This has got 256 kilobytes on board in RAM so it takes a little while to get through it. Eventually it does and when it does you hear a beep. Uh, the disk drive light goes on and it reads the operating system from the disk. Now there was no built-in clock 
in these original IBM PC machines so you had to enter the date and time each time you booted up the machine so it could date stamp your files correctly or you could simply ignore it and it would just use the default date and time so there we are we've booted up and you can see the uh, flashing cursor there next to the uh, A which shows that uh, we're focused on the first disk drive so if we do a directory of that uh, here we have the files that are associated with the operating system so I've got a, a DOS disk in there and that's what the machine has booted off so all of those files are, are part of PC DOS. Now I'm going to remove the DOS disk from uh, the A drive and put in a, another disk containing DisplayWrite which is a word processor. This is a piece of software that came in one of those boxes that you saw. So we'll boot that up and you can have a have a look at that. So we get a nice IBM colored splash screen and then uh, a menu giving us or enabling us to do some tasks. So just create a document. You can see pretty standard word processor interface with a ruler on top and ability to type text into the computer. So like any good word processor it has wrap around, it has some basic functions. It never actually caught on the, it never became one of the major word processors for the IBM PC even though it was the one sold by IBM. Now I want to show you a tutorial program here. This is a disk that's called Exploring the IBM PC. It took users through the basics of using the system. So I'll just have a look at some of these screens. You can see it's in a different mode. It's in its graphics mode now. Compared to these days it's certainly very uh, cheesy. The music's very simple. Of course you can't get too much out of that PC speaker. Uh, there's no, there was no sound card or even no sound chip in, uh, in the IBM PC. So it's a friendly little tutorial and again looking at it with the eyes of early 1980s these computers were a bit daunting to people uh, especially if you had business people that were starting to use these, these PCs or even secretaries. Uh, they'd never come across computers before most of them they certainly never interacted with one before so although these tutorials can seem very simplistic and almost patronizing they they weren't for the time uh, this was all pretty new stuff to people so I've just picked out a few selected parts here to show you so this one's looking at uh, disk drives explaining what they are or how they work now the IBM PC, even, even though this is a color graphics uh, configuration, it's still pretty primitive and they do a reasonable job with the very uh, primitive graphics and color capability uh, they've got here. Yeah, so there's a little bit of whimsy uh, in this particular tutorial. This part covers basic and you can see representation of a computer there and how it works. I won't go through the whole tutorial but it is quite neat in that it gives users a shell that they can use so they can type into uh, a virtual basic machine in the tutorial and get some explanation as to exactly what they're doing. That's quite neat. Now like many of the home machines of the day and earlier machines BASIC was in ROM in the IBM PC, although you could load an extended version of BASIC off a disk. The clone machines didn't have BASIC in ROM, they just had BASIC uh, on, on the operating system disk. So what I'm going to do is load in a few sample programs that came with the BASIC manual for the IBM PC. And these are things uh, that illustrate some of the hardware capabilities 
and some of the commands in BASIC. You look at them now and they're quite laughable really and very very simple. Um, they certainly didn't hold a candle up to some of the game machines that were starting to appear uh, at that time. When I say games machine I'm, I'm talking about home machines. So those are machines like the VIC-20, uh, the Commodore 64 uh, a year later, a year or two later. So you can see there's nothing too sophisticated there. And it, it indicates really that these machines were going into the business market and in the early 1980s, color, sound, graphics were really no big deal. It was mainly spreadsheet stuff, monochrome was fine, uh, these things were considered playful and superfluous in many ways. Just one final thing to show you, this is a uh, diagnostic program that we've also got for the machine. It just uh, asks you to check various outputs to check the hardware is okay. So now on to manuals. So this is the guide to operation. So this is the uh, very important manual that shows you how to use the machine. These IBM manuals are quite well written. There's, they're, they're, they're written in a very straightforward way style and they're all kind of the same same layout and format but as you'd expect with IBM very professionally done and everything's explained uh, not tremendously exciting they don't make it too whimsical like some of the home computing magazines but uh, everything is there that you need This is the manual for PC-DOS, the disk operating system. The version I've got is 2.1, which about fits the date of the machine. A machine like the one that I've got with 256K on board, uh, the main board, and disk drives that are double-sided, they came out around about 1983. That's a quite a typical uh, configuration. The original motherboards had 64K, the ones that came out in 1981. So the manual again goes through all the commands that are used. Same sort of style. It uses uh, green text to illustrate a uh, an output or an input. Then we have the basic manual. Again, same sort of style. Goes through all of the major commands. Talks about how you get basic started. The different versions of basic you've got. There are three versions of basic. There's the basic that's built into ROM, and that's known as cassette basic. And that's the basic you'd use if you didn't have any disk drives attached. And then there is a disk basic, and that's loaded off the disk. Although I guess it uses a lot of the code in ROM. And then you've got Advanced Basic, and Advanced Basic uh, does uh, everything that Disk Basic does, and uh, and a little more. So the manual's pretty good, like the other IBM ones, pretty well written. And finally, we have the manual for Display Write, which is the word processor, and and here we see. A difference in that this manual is, rather than the traditional portrait uh, orientation, this is in landscape, so I guess the idea is to have it open on your desk like that and just uh, flip the pages as you need them. But again, a pretty uh, well-written manual, as all these, all these IBM ones are. So those are the four manuals that I've got. 
So what are my final thoughts on the IBM PC? Well, love it or loathe it, it is a very significant microcomputer model. It stamped a hardware standard on business computing. It stamped a software standard on business computing that uh, as it moved downwards into uh, more personal computing, uh, by the late 1980s, uh, 1990s, almost everyone was using uh, these PC machines or machines that at least were derived from this platform. You still had a few um, other manufacturers out there like Apple. They found a niche for themselves and managed to survive. Uh, you had sort of higher end home machines like Amiga's Atari's that certainly hardware wise were you know, very much more capable than this, uh, the IBM PC type platform. But um, these machines and Microsoft with its MS-DOS and then later on Windows just completely dominated the industry. It all started with this machine, so it's a significant computer, and I'm certainly pleased to have it in the collection. Well, I hope you enjoyed that look at the IBM PC. Now, for those of you that, that have been following these videos uh, and these remakes, as I've done them, uh, this will be the last remake. I've now got rid of all the embarrassing uh, videos that were there before, and uh, although... These videos can always be improved. I am reasonably happy with the ones that uh, I've got. They're either medium definition or high definition. So I won't be doing any more uh, of these remakes. So the other videos you'll see for me, from me will be new models or some other technology that uh, I might feel as we're talking about. So until then, keep well, and we'll see you in the next video.